Hey, howdy everybody. So we have finished our discussion here on spatial statistics and geostatistics about varigram calculation, varigram interpretation modeling. We learned how to use it within the creaking system. And now we're going to talk about simulation. Now, we're motivated by the fact that there is something just wrong with creaking. What's wrong with creaking? Well, if we look at creaking, what we'll find is that it is an estimation method. It does its job very well. Its job is to get at each single location in space the very best value, the most likely value at each location, the Kriging estimate. But if you take all of those estimates in space, they're too smooth. In fact, we don't expect that Kriging would honor the global distribution. All of those estimates are way too smooth. There's not very much variability in them, and so the variance is going, going to be too low. Also, what's interesting is we tell you that we use the varigram to make a Kriging estimate, but if we calculate the varigram of a set of Kriging estimates, we would not reproduce the varigram. It would be too smooth. If we had a spherical, if we had spherical structure, we would expect that the varigram would maybe have a Gaussian structure or maybe a longer range. It would be smooth, specifically in the very short range. So let's take a very simple example right here. We have a residual V shale. So we have detrended this V shale or fraction of shale variable. And the black line would represent a Kriging estimation. You got the data, Data dots are representing the data values. It's a one-dimensional example just for illustration. We've got data at one, two, three, four, and five locations, and you can see the respective dots. The Kriging estimates are going to be at the data, the data locations, plus or minus my drafting ability. And if you look at that, that's a Kriging model. Or at distances greater than the range, we go to the global mean. That's simple Kriging. But the actual phenomenon we're trying to estimate, the inaccessible truth, in fact, looks like this, the red line. There's heterogeneity in it. There's variability in it. And so we need something that will provide us models that represent the entire distribution, have the extreme values, that aren't too continuous. If we're going to use these models for the purpose of any type of subsurface forecasting, it's important to get heterogeneity. You can't lose that. So we need a method to be able to correct for that. That's the simulation method. That's our motivation. So let's compare estimation with simulation, the two workflows. What are they trying to do? Well, estimation is going to honor the local data. So will simulation. That's not, that's not a problem. Now, with estimation, if you have a nugget effect, you might have a bit of discontinuity at the data locations. Estimation is also locally very accurate. It seeks to get the very best value at each location. It smooths, so it's appropriate for some type of visualization of trends to understand general features, but it is inappropriate for any type of a transfer function or process that requires heterogeneity in order to get a good estimate. There is also no assessment of global uncertainty, and we'll get into what that means. Simulation, check honors the local data but in addition it actually honors the whole histogram the entire cdf or pdf is going to be reproduced it's also going to honor the spatial variability and so now it becomes because we got the full variability remember variance of permeability and spread of permeability matter dextra parsons was all about that spread remember that we also cared about spatial continuity. We showed examples in which we saw that flow and recovery factors were impacted dramatically by different spatial continuities. So you'll be very happy to know we get the histogram. We're also going to get the right spatial continuity. We can use it. We also get alternative realizations. And all we have to do is change the random number seed to get that. And you'll see that shortly. And we can do that to account for spatial uncertainty. And so now an assessment of global uncertainty is possible for us. So just look at the definitions of estimation and simulation. We've talked about what they do differently. Estimation, a method to calculate the best estimate at each location. 
So that's any type of spatial estimation, the best value at each location. It focuses on local accuracy. Globally, it's too smooth. It's not realistic. It, realistic. If you take all of the estimates jointly, it's not right. Simulation. The method to calculate a good, reasonable estimate at each location. You sacrifice local accuracy, but because you focus on global accuracy, having the right distribution and the right variogram, so you, you say it's okay, I just need a good value, a reasonable value at each location, but I want to get it right globally. So let's talk a little bit more about the smoothing effect of Kriging, and we'll understand what's going on here. Kriging is locally accurate, it's too smooth. We can visualize with it, can't use it if we need heterogeneity. We said that. The variance of the Kriged estimates is too small. The variance of the Kriged estimates, so the variance of all the estimates, y, star representing these estimates is equal to the total variability minus the simple Kriging estimation variance. Well, you would expect, what do you expect for the variability over the entire model for the Kriging estimates? Well, they should have the same variability as the initial sample data. That would be what we hope for, sigma squared. We expect it to have the same variability of the entire sample data. Instead, it has this variability, the variance minus the simple Kriging estimation variance. Therefore, we know that simple Kriging um, is too smooth, and we know that the amount it's too smooth by is the simple Kriging estimation variance. So just consider the following. Just try to imagine different circumstances to kind of re rationalize through this. Simple Kriging variance is zero at the data locations. And that makes sense. At data locations, the estimation variance is zero. There's no uncertainty whatsoever. And there's no smoothing. In fact, Kriging doesn't do any smoothing at the data locations. If you were to have a model that was just data values, the variance of that model would be the right variance. The problem is when we move away from the data. So if we move beyond the range of the data, so we get far enough away from the data that there's no spatial correlation with the data, the Kriging variance is equal to the total variance. It's maximum uncertainty. And all estimates will be equal to the global mean or the trend. Well, if we're talking residuals, it's going to be the global mean, which is zero. If we have a set of estimated values and they're all out of range of data and they all have zero, the variance is actually zero. There's no variability, complete smoothing. How much variance is missing? All of it. The simple, the simple Kriging estimation variance at all those locations will be equal to the variance. It's all missing. It's too smooth, completely too smooth. So, of course, the spatial variations and the estimation variance at all locations can be dependent on the data and the variogram. Specifically, the variogram range is going to be very important. That'll tell you whether or not you have some correlation or not. And the nugget effect, of course, will be important too. It'll tell you whether or not you jump up in estimation variance as soon as you get away from data. So let's put together a proposal to correct Kriging. Let's design a methodology whereby we can correct Kriging so that we don't have this issue of not reproducing the histogram nor the variogram. So let's be concerned about the missing variance. So we know that the missing variance in the, in the estimates is the Kriging variance. And we know that we can use a simulation method to correct the variance to get the right histogram. And that simulation method is to add, we take the Kriging estimate and we add a residual to it. The random residual with a mean of zero and a variance equal to the missing variance, so we will just add it back. Now, we've treated this before. We've, we've dealt with the fact that variance is additive. We've been doing it all over the place. Nested structures and variograms, we've been talking about adding different components of the variance that describe different spatial frequencies. We talked about it when we talked about expectation. And so we take advantage, once again, of this idea of the additivity of variance, and we can add a residual in and then add, get that variance that was missing. 
and we want to correct the covariance so we have the right varigram, so the varigram is reproduced in our models. The method we're going to show for that is sequential simulation. We're going to add the simulated values to the data as we proceed sequentially, and that will impose the right spatial continuity between the simulated values. Simulation reproduces the histogram on our spatial variability, the varigram. So then it becomes appropriate for any type of process that requires us to understand spatial heterogeneity, which for us dealing with subsurface, many problems are like that. In fact, Krieging is really uh, is used most in settings in which you have dense data and you have a transfer function that's more very simplistic, something that's maybe volumetric calculations and so forth. You may not need the full range of heterogeneity if you're going to be scaling up to some type of larger aggregate volumes or concentrations, but it still may be important. Okay. So simulation. It's also going to allow us to assess uncertainty globally through multiple alternative realizations. And so now let's prove this that, that prove that this will work. Let's go ahead and get into a couple of proofs. The proofs have all been taken from the book Geostatistical Reservoir Modeling. The second edition was Perch and Deutsch. Of course, I give credit. I believe the proof was, of course, in the first original edition by Deutsch alone back in 2004. So full credit for that. So, recall this simple Kriegen estimator right here. Simple, we're working for residuals. We don't have to talk anything about one minus the sum of the weights. That all gets cooked in as soon as we're dealing with the residuals. We also showed a very brief summary of the derivation of simple Kriegen that resulted in this system, linear system of equations. And we can go ahead now and do a check. Let's check. Let's calculate the covariance between the Krieged, a Krieged estimate and one of the data values. So we got a Krieged estimate at a location, unknown location. We got the data values, I should say, between the data values. And so we can go ahead and calculate this. If we do, what we'll notice is if we assume zero, we can expand it out like this. It's just the product, expected value of the product. And if we go ahead and we calculate the expected value of the product, excuse that comma, it shouldn't be there, then we would be able to substitute for the estimate, the estimator shown right here. We go ahead and we simplify that further. And what you'll find, in fact, is, is that the result is we can substitute the simple Kriegen constraint from here into here. And in fact, the covariance between the estimate and the data locations is equal to the covariance between the unknown locations and the data. So what's that tell us? The covariance between the data and the estimates is correct. It's imposed by the simple Kriegen system. That part of the covariance is correct for us. So the, Kriegen, so the problem here with covariance is interesting because we know we're okay between the data and the estimate location. Well, let's look at the different parts of covariance and let's check and see where the problem's coming. Between the data values themselves, we know that's correct. The variance is correct. The varigram is correct. Everything's correct at the data locations. Between the data values and the predicted or estimated locations, it's correct too, and we just showed that. The problem comes about between the predicted values, and we know that intuitively. If I make a Kriging estimate at this location right here, I make another Kriging estimate at this location right here, they're estimated independent of each other. There's no constraint to impose the right spatial continuity between the two. So, and we also recall that the variance is still too small. We're gonna we're gonna get to that. We're gonna get to that. We'll we'll get that treated with the residual. And so what do we have to do? Well, we need to add the missing variance in. That's a We propose that we're going to work with a residual. We know the variance is supposed to equal to the cell, which is the sample variance of our data set. The stationary variance should be constant everywhere. There's everywhere. There's nowhere to no reason to assume that at the data locations that the, the variance should be lower or higher, we, assuming a stationarity here. Although the covariance between the Kriegd estimates and the data is correct, the variance is still too small. And we talked about the fact that the missing variance is the Kriegd variance. So we need to add back in a missing variance component. We're going to add back in the missing variance 
but we want to make sure that we're not changing the covariance reproduction because we said we're doing a fine job with the covariance between the data and the estimate location. So let's check that. Let's check if we go ahead and we add a random independent component with zero mean and the correct variance to our previous Kriging estimate, and we'll call that a simulated value. Let's check and make sure that we haven't messed up the covariance between the assimilated values and the data locations. And so we'll go ahead and check that. We'll check the covariance between the simulated values and all of the data locations. And of course, once again, assuming, assuming a zero mean, we can just explain that as a product, the expected value of the product of the two. And once again, we can substitute in for the simulated value this these two components right here. We've done that right here. We can expand it out. Now what's very interesting is that this component right here will go to zero. It just disappears. The reason being is the residual and the data are independent of each other and we know from expectation as an operator that the expectation of a product, if they're independent random variables, is equal to the expectation of the first multiplied by the expectation of the separate. Second, the expectation of the random residual, its average is zero. So in fact, that's just going to disappear. We're left with just this side right here. And so therefore, we know that once again, by substitution with the simple Kriging system, once again, we find that in fact, the covariance is correct. We have therefore, we find that the covariance between the simulated value and the data is equal to the covariance that we had before between the estimate and the data locations. So we haven't messed up the covariance. The covariance is still okay between our data and our simulate, now simulated location. So let's go ahead. We, we've shown that this will work for us. We've shown that we're in good shape. We can move forward with a procedure where we can fix Kriging so that we can honor the histogram and the varigram and also get a model of global uncertainty. So first of all, let's define all of the separate concepts in sequential Gaussian simulation. First we have sequential because we're going to sequentially include all of the simulated values and tr we're going to treat them as data. So we're going to simulate a value. After we simulate it, we'll put it into the data set and we're going to treat it like it's data in order to impose the correct spatial continuity or correlation between all of the simulated values. Because we know Kriging gets the correlation, spatial continuity correct, between the data and the new estimate locations. We'll take advantage of that by sequentially including our simulations to make sure that we get the right spatial continuity. Gaussian because we work in Gaussian space. The data is transformed to Gaussian before we work with it. We calculate the variogram in Gaussian. And in doing this, if we calculate a local estimate, the conditional local co conditional distributions based on a local estimate, a mean coming from the Kriging estimate, and a variance coming from the estimation variance or the Kriging variance, with those two parameters, if we assume Gaussian, we now know the full distribution of uncertainty at each location. Remember, in Gaussian space, everything is Gaussian. All of the conditionals, joints, marginals, everything remains Gaussian. And so we take advantage of that. Simulation, because we use Monte Carlo simulation to draw from this Gaussian distribution, the local conditional distributions that we calculate from Kriging, we draw from them with the Gaussian, with, um, with Monte Carlo simulation, and that allows us to be able to add in the missing variance and to construct multiple equal probable realizations. Okay, so here's take number one. I'm gonna have two takes at this. Take number one will kind of more words at the overall sequential simulation framework. Take number two, we will show pictures and kind of show it more illustratively how it gets done in an actual grid. First step, transform the data to standard normal. That just means Gaussian with a mean of zero, a variance of one. All your work is going to be done in normal Gaussian space. Go to a location, perform Kriging to get a mean and corresponding Kriging variance. Kriging, we talked about in the last lecture series, we know how to do that. 
draw a random residual that follows the normal distribution of a mean of zero and a variance of the Krieging estimation variance. Add the Krieg to estimate and the residual together to get a simulated value. Now note, what I'll show in subsequent steps and when talking about this will suggest that we combine those two steps in one. All we do is instead of using a residual, we just say draw a value with a mean equal to the Krieging estimate, already shifted, and the variance equal to the estimation variance. It's the same thing as this two-step process. Then we're going to add the simulated value at that new location to the data set. And we're going to treat it like data. That way we impose the right covariance between the simulated value we just simulated and all subsequently simulated values. The key idea is that we use those previously creaked simulated values and then we get the right spatial continuity between all the simulated values. Now we're going to we're going to visit all locations in random order. This avoids, this is just a practical approach to avoid artifacts. So something I like to say to my students is, have you ever flown in an airplane over a farmer's field? When you look down, can you tell which way the tractor goes? And the answer is, yeah, you can see striations in the field caused by the tractor, its movement through the field. That's kind of what happens if you use a regular path when you're sequentially simulating. You get a high value, you can propagate it across, and it can cause striations or features, and we break that up by using random path. We back transform all the data values and simulated values when the model has been completely populated. You create another equal probable realization by, by starting again, but with a new random number seed, so that you'll in fact get a different random path, and you'll do different Monte Carlo simulations and it'll change up the model quite a bit, actually. Okay, so why Gaussian simulation? Well, the local estimate is given by Krieging. And if that's given to us and the variance is given to us by Krieging, however, what shape of distribution should we be considering, should we be working with? And so by using Gaussian with the two parameters, the Krieging estimate and the Krieging variance, we therefore know all of the parameters so that we know the entire CDF to do Monte Carlo simulation with. The other advantage is that the normal Gaussian distribution is that the global distribution will be preserved. If we transform to Gaussian and then we do a bunch of Monte Carlo simulations from different Gaussian distributions, the ultimate distribution at the end will also be Gaussian. And so the whole thing will remain consistent. Everything in Gaussian space is Gaussian. We're going to transform the data to Gaussian, to normal scores, standard normal, in the beginning, before variography. And the reason being is that the variogram is being used in Gaussian space, so you should calculate the variogram on the Gaussian transform of the variable. We're going to simulate 3D realizations in normal space. Then when we're done, we're going to back transform when all values are done. We've got the whole model populated. Now, there's never any free lunch. My advisor always told me during my PhD. And so there is no free lunch here too. The price, there's great mathematical simplicity to the Gaussian assumption. But the price of this mathematical simplicity is a characteristic of maximum spatial entropy. Practically defined, we say that the lows and the highs, the values at the tails of the distribution, are as disconnected as possible. Now, we could say because of that, we should be concerned about using this for permeability because it could affect conduits, barriers, baffles, and so forth. I would say we should be careful with it with porosity permeability. We should also be thoughtful about trend models and so forth. So we would expect the Gaussian distribution to maximize this entropy. So maximum spatial disorder beyond the variogram is a consequence. Maximum disconnectedness of extreme values. The median values have the greatest connectivity. And so we would expect, and then symmetric disconnectedness, the extreme low values, extreme high values, will be just as disconnected. There will be a symmetry around the center of the distribution. Okay, here's take number two. That was take number one for explaining sequential Gaussian simulation.
If we got that far and you're still looking at this video saying, I don't, I still don't know what that is, well, give me another chance. Let's see if I can get you to understand this. So these are all of the steps. A little bit wordy. Let's walk through them and then I'll show it to you in pictures. Establish a grid network, coordinate system, flatten the system. Assign the data to the grid. Account for any type of scale change if there is a scale change between the data and the size of the grid cells. Now, I should note, up until now, this has been just like creaking or any type of method where you're trying to estimate within a framework. Transform the data to normal space. That's, that's new, to Gaussian space. Now you can calculate the varigram. Okay, so here's the, here's the simulation. Determine a random path through the grid nodes that don't have data. Find the nearby data. Go, go to the first location. Loop over the nodes. Go to the very first location. Find any data within a search and any previously simulated nodes. Construct a conditional distribution by using Krieging. Draw simulated values from the conditional distribution. That's Monte Carlo simulation. Assign the simulated value to the grid as data. Loop to the next location. Keep going until you fill the grid up. Now, step number six is just checking. After you fill the grid up, just check. Do you honor the data? Check. Honor the histogram? Should be standard normal at this point. Do you have that? Do you honor the varigram? Check that. Once you're good with it, back transform from normal space back to the original distribution. Ah, you'll reproduce the original distribution. That's important. You restore to the original framework. If you flattened and you had some type of undulation or stratigraphic complexity or maybe some faulting or something, you restore it back to that state. Then you could check at that point, did I honor the geologic concepts, geophysical information, production data, and so forth. And to calculate multiple realizations, just go back up to the top. You could probably, you could go right back up to just determining a random path and you could loop through. Now you may want to change distributions and variograms and so forth if you feel that that's an uncertainty. But in general, we would just go to a new random path, draw new values with Monte Carlo simulation, and we would get a totally different realization. We call those realizations. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about the steps with more pictures. We got our porosity distribution. We're trying to simulate it on this grid. We got our well two or our well one. It's an anti-cline original framework structure. We flatten it and we assign a grid network. We assign the data that's been interpreted, upscaled, to the grid cells. So now we have data populating our grid. And you notice that there's been some upscaling. The distribution may have changed to reflect that upscaling. Volume variance. We get less variability if we have a larger scale that we're working at. Now we transform the data values to normal space standard normal. Zero mean one variance Gaussian distributions. So our values have all been transformed. We transform this upscale distribution to Gaussian. Go ahead and calculate the varigram. And so we calculate and model the varigram in the primary directions. We've done a lot on that. We're good to go. We determine a random path through the grid nodes. Now you'll notice on this slide I got lazy. I'm going to defend it and say that I didn't want to fill in every cell, it would be too noisy, but I got tired of doing this. So I went up to, I think, 13, my favorite number. So I went up to 13, and but you can imagine all these empty cells would also have values in it. It's a random path going to all cells. Eventually, every cell that doesn't have data will be visited. Okay. Then for the first node on the random path, we're going to go ahead and look around ourselves. We're going to look at the search neighborhood. We're going to gather all of the data and previously simulated nodes. We've got two data right there. We're going to construct the, the conditional distribution by doing Krieging. We do our Krieging. We get a Krieging estimate. We get a Krieging variance. We assume Gaussian. Boom! We got the whole entire distribution. We know the entire distribution now. And so we have this distribution of uncertainty at that location with regard to what's going on. And so that's super cool because then what we can do is we can convert it into a CDF. We do Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo simulation, draw a random p-value uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. So we preserve the original distribution. Take that value, 
and sample from the distribution, the CDF, basically the inverse of the CDF for that p-value, and we get a specific value, negative 0.6, it's Gaussian. They're Gaussian values. That's why it's okay to have negative. Even though it's porosity, it's a Gaussian transform of porosity, so we get a negative. And look, at the grid node, we now have that value. We've assigned our simulated value to the grid. It's now there. Ah, so now we go to the next location. We gather up the data. We don't have any previously simulated nodes at this location, and we perform our creaking. We calculate the creaking estimate, the creaking variance. We do the inverse of the CDF, that comes from assuming a Gaussian distribution, and we get our realization to put at that location. We go here, and we go to all locations. Now pretend this entire grid is filled up by Gaussian distributed values, probably negative three to positive three or so. And so that's, we would expect it complete. I, I got tired of filling them in. Then what we could do is we could check the results. We could check the distribution to make sure it's Gaussian zero one. We could check the variogram to make sure it's correct in Gaussian space because we calculate it in Gaussian space. So we make sure everything's okay. Make sure we honor the data at the data locations. We should because we assign the data to the, to the cells where the wells or whatever data source intersected those cells. So we should have the data right at the data locations. Then we take all of those Gaussian values and we back transform them back to the original distribution. So you can see all these values are porosities measured in a fraction. And so we have all of our values at all locations. And so now we have a reservoir property model. Honors the data at the data locations. Honors the histogram. The complete histogram is matched. And it honors the variogram, the spatial continuity model. And so here we have it. We have a realization I've drawn schematically with some kind of a contour kind of look. And we would restore it to the original grid framework so we're just going to deform it again, restore it back. So we have our well data, we have our heterogeneity model. And at this point, we probably want to check the geologic concepts to make sure it matches any type of geophysical, production data, and so forth. And we can start doing some type of flow simulation, seeing how it behaves. We start to learn from our realizations. Eureka, a realization from our realizations. That's what happens. And we can calculate multiple realizations by simply just going back to the step of assigning a random path. If we use a new random number seed, we would get a different path. And at every single location, we would get a different Monte Carlo simulation. And that would have a different influence on all of the other subsequently simulated values that are using the previously simulated values as conditioning data. And so in that way, you get a totally different realization just by changing the random number seed, honoring the same histogram, honoring the same variogram, honoring the data, but expressing spatial uncertainty. We still don't know what's going on between the data locations. So let's just take a look at some simulated realizations. Excuse me, I'm overlapping the plot here, but you can just see it's a simple spherical variogram with no nugget effect. Here's an exponential variogram. Here's a Gaussian. They all have the same range. The range is 600 meters, isotropic in all three cases. Here's two realizations for each of these variograms. They both have the same distributions too. And you can see the color scales here. Their porosity units go from 0 to 30% porosity, which is the orange type, orange colors. And so we can see the overall type of behavior of a spherical versus exponential, which has more short-scale variability, but has a little bit greater and long-range continuity. And then the Gaussian, which is very smooth in the short distances, but is also has very much like the exponential and as far as long-range continuity. Now, what's very instructive is we could go ahead and look away from data values. And so one of the best things to do is pick the corners of the model. So here we are, a data point at the X, or the, the cross right there. At this corner of the model, we have a very low porosity, less than 5%. If we go over to this model, in fact, it's yellow. It's 20%. What does that mean? We're so far away from data that we would expect the uncertainty spans the entire range of the, of the input distribution. And so that's what we're seeing there. And if you look all over the model, you can convince yourself that at this location here, this location here, they're both very high because you have a high data value conditioning. 
but then away from it, it stays high, then it drops down to a median value. Here it stays high and even gets a little bit higher. And so away from the data, you'll see lots of fluctuations. You look across these simulated realizations, you'll see that over and over again. That is spatial uncertainty. You know the global distribution, you know the barogram, you know the data, but you still don't know what's going on away from the data locations, and the amount of fluctuation will depend on the amount of correlation with local data. Here's another example where all we did was take a spherical with an rain, isotropic range of 600, and we just went ahead and varied the relative nugget effect from 0, 50, to 90% relative nugget effect. And this is pretty instructive because you can see the same long-range features in all three. It's just the amount of short-scale noise when it, within each of the models. And you can do that with simulation. Another thing that's very useful is look at multiple realizations of simulation. Realization number 1, 2, and 3. And compare them to exactly what you would have got with Kriging. And so here's the ordinary Kriging, and you can see that if we use the same color bar on all three, the Kriging looks almost completely green. Because away from the data, with a little bit of nugget effect, it drops really quickly, or, or it, goes, it goes very quickly to the global mean. Now we spent a lot of time during this discussion trying to convince you that we need to reproduce input statistics. We need to honor well, data, we want to honor the data, but we also need to honor the histogram, the CDF, and the varigram. And what I'm going to tell you now, I hope it doesn't shock you, but it turns out that there may be fluctuations in the way that we honor those statistics. These fluctuations are known as ergodic fluctuations. And so what can we say about them? When will we see these ergodic fluctuations? Well, in general, if the model is large relative to the spatial continuity, so we have a big model with short spatial continuity, we expect these fluctuations to be minimal. They shouldn't really be very obvious. It shouldn't be an issue. If the model is small and the spatial continuity within that model is very long, then we expect that these fluctuations can become extreme. So let's take those previous models that I just showed and let's go ahead and look at for the case of the Gaussian exponential and this should be labeled as spherical here at the top. Here is the CDF. The black line is the experimental CDF. It's steppy. <laughs> Step, it has steps in it because it's experimental based on few data. And we have the resulting CDFs as continuous lines because they're, they're very much more smooth and continuous because they're based on the entire model, a lot more points. And you can see that there's some fluctuation. It's not too bad, but in general, there's fluctuations. The Verigram, you can see that we have the, there's lines, there's black and red lines, which are for the different directions, the experimentals. And then we have the dots represent the actual experimental variograms calculated from the simulated realizations. And we can see there's actually some pretty good fluctuations here. So what do we say in general? What are we looking for? Look at the CDFs. You'd hope that the fluctuations should span the CDF, the target CDF, and not show any specific bias in one direction or the other, that they should have results that are higher and lower. And the same thing for the Verigram, as we see here, where there's some higher and some lower. We could get concerned. We could look at this and say, well, look, all the realizations seem to be higher. What's going on here? Is it an issue with the variance being inflated with this model? Should we check to make sure that the SIL is right? We may want to check our models further with regard to these fluctuations. All right, so that's the end of the lecture on simulation. Now we will get into indicator-based simulation, co-simulation, how do you deal with more than one variable at a time. So we're not done yet with the spatial. We're gonna have a couple more lectures before, and I think we may just jump right into some machine learning and some uncertainty analysis at that point. As usual, I hope that this was helpful to you. I'm easy to get a hold of. I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. You can find me, look me up. And um, I'm also Geostats Guy on Twitter, and so you can see some of my content.
and what I'm doing there. I announce things almost daily. All right. Thank you.